So, <clears throat> again, my name is Matthew Buckley. I'm a doctor of chiropractic, a doctor of pastoral medicine. <clears throat> and I got in the field of natural healing because I had my own health complaints that were largely being on and now addressed by the conventional medical system. Specifically, I was dealing with uh, chronic fatigue and widespread aches and pains. And <clears throat> this all began at a, at a young age. I, I was 18 when I started to develop these symptoms. I'm working my way through the HMO model. I was eventually told that I was depressed, and certainly I was depressed because I knew that my body was not in good shape, and they didn't seem to have any answers outside of these two pills that weren't really helping me out. And so I ended up leaving that system at that point in time and never asked for their help again as far as that, that one. <clears throat> and um, when I turned 27, I enrolled in chiropractic school largely to try and seek answers to my health problems. I grew up with chiropractic in, in my family, so it wasn't odd to me. I didn't realize at that point in time that chiropractic was considered quackery by, by many people. It was just normal to me. <clears throat> and so I felt like if I was going to solve my problems, um, I was going to have to understand them better. And chiropractic seemed like it was an avenue that I could potentially do that. And so the information that I present to you tonight really represents a distillation of the years of research that it took for me to uncover those problems. And likewise, um, this information is what I've been using in my office to help a lot of people out with various forms of chronic illness. And <clears throat> I believe strongly that if the information that I was that I'm presenting tonight was integrated on a national basis, that healthcare costs would go down dramatically. It's so fundamental to everybody's health. And I think that as you um, hear my presentation, well, it'll become clear what that is, okay? But I want to be clear, the information, this is this is considered to be part one of what's either going to be a part two or three part <clears throat> course. And the toxins that I'm going to talk about are certainly things that you've heard about before, but maybe you did not understand how and why there are problems, okay? So, just provide a little legal disclaimer to make the, uh, the lawyers happy. This is an informational lecture. The information may or may not pertain to your condition. I cannot give specific recommendations for treatment. Treatment should be properly done on an individual basis in consultation with your health care provider. Huh. So there's a, there's a distinction between conventional medicine and natural healing. Conventional medicine is, is allopathic. According to the MedTerms Dictionary, allopathic medicine is defined as a system of medical practice which treats disease by the use of remedies which produces effects, otherwise known as symptoms, different from those uh, produced by the disease, disease under treatment. Medical doctors practice allopathic medicine. So within conventional medicine, there's, there tends to be three guiding principles on of what's causing the body to really break down. You have the germ theory of disease. If you're exposed to a particular pathogen, then you know they'll make you ill, and then you're going to die from that. Right? The next thing is the genetic cause. You have a bad gene, and then you're going to develop cancer. You're going to develop heart disease from that. Okay. And the other thing is the diet, which is sort of vaguely defined within conventional medicine. They tend to advocate the low-fat, low-cholesterol diet. Okay. <clears throat> but what what has that really yielded? Not very good health. I think you'd all agree. So there's fundamental flaws with the germ theory of disease, uh, one of which happens to do with um, what's, there's, there's been a great deal of research lately looking at what's called the microbiome. The microbiome relates to the microbes living in and on our body. Okay? And what they found through studying, looking at the microbiome, is that there's a number of microorganisms that are considered to be pathogenic that, that have a home on our body, but they don't necessarily cause problems. For example, Streptococcus pneumoniae, which happens to be a pathogen that people are vaccinated for, is commonly found on people, but it doesn't necessarily cause problems. So there's a lot of people out there, well, I, I don't want to get exposed to this particular pathogen, so I want to make sure that I get vaccinated. Right? You may already have it on you. So is it really a matter of exposure, or is it a matter of something else going on within the body that causes the pathogen to become pathogenic? So <clears throat> this is from the Center for Acute Disease Epidemiology. This isn't just me saying it. It says many people carry the bacteria in their nose and throat without becoming ill, even though this is the most common cause of middle ear infections, sepsis in children, and pneumonia, and immunocompromised individuals and the elderly. 
And then there's MRSA. Is there anybody here that hasn't heard of MRSA? Okay, so met methicillin resistant staph aureus. So it's, it's a form of staph that is resistant to antibiotics. And uh, when people have this in the acute stage, it can, it can cause a lot of problems because the antibiotics are just, they're just resistant to it. But what they found is that 5% of the population actually carries this form of bacteria, the methicillin resistant uh, bacteria. So you may be a carrier, but it may not necessarily cause us problems. So again, if it's all about the microbe and trying to prevent the exposure to the microbes, why is it that so many people are walking around with these microbes, but they're not coming down with the full infection? Make sense? Because okay, so then we got the, the genetic cause, okay? Clearly genes affect our health, but <clears throat> they're not the controlling factor within our body, okay? And there's a, there's a study here. If you, if you got my newsletter, you probably saw it on there. So these two, two mice, they're genetically identical, okay? You got um, this tan kind of fat one, and then you got the healthier looking thinner brown one. They live in the same environment, um, were fed the same food, and genetically speaking, they were both predisposed towards developing cancer and diabetes, okay? The one on the right was supplemented with folic acid, choline, betaine, and B12. <clears throat> and while they were, they were exposed to this carcinogen, this BPA, um, clearly the one that was supplemented didn't appear to be developing the same problems that, that the other one did, meaning that the fat tan one was developing the sort of problems that it was genetically predisposed to. But apparently the nutrients were interfering with the ability for the genes, the bad genes, to really express themselves. Okay? Point being is that um, there's a lot that you can do from an epigenetic standpoint. Epigeno epigenomics is the, the study of what influences the genes. Okay? Nutrition plays a large role. Toxicity plays a large role. What we think plays a large role. Otherwise, uh, another interesting point is that the cell can actually survive without the DNA. So if, the, if a lot of people think, well, the DNA is the master controller of the cell. Well, if it's the master controller, it wouldn't be able to survive without it. One thing they can survive without is, is the cell membrane. And I'm gonna, that's going to lead into what I'm going to talk about in terms of um, some of the toxins. So, as it relates to diet, in 19, 1982, the American Medical Association and the American Heart Association the U.S. government recommended that we reduce our fat consumption down from 40% of the diet to 30%. And collectively, as, as a nation, we actually did that. <clears throat> Since that time, what's happened? Well, disease rates continue to go up. They're not going down. So the low fat, no fat craze. It's a quote from George Bernard Shaw. He said, no diet will remove all the fat from your body because if it brings entire fat without a brain, you might look good, but all I could do is run for public Okay, so statistically, heart disease is the, uh, officially the leading cause of death in the United States. One out of four people currently have some form of heart disease right now. It's estimated to kill over 600,000 people every year, and the total health care expenditures on that are over $400 billion per year. So the approach to actually reducing cholesterol to try and drive down those numbers um, doesn't appear to have a whole lot of benefit. These are This is a summary of a meta-analysis, which is a study of studies, okay? The organization that did this is a, uh, a group of medical doctors that poured through the, the literature to determine what, what does the science actually say, actually say as it relates to how effective certain treatments are. And this was analyzing uh, statin drugs given for five years for heart disease prevention to people who had no known heart disease. So 98% saw no benefit, 0% were helped by being safe from death, 1.6% were helped by preventing a heart attack, 0.4% were uh, helped by preventing a stroke, but yet 2% were harmed by developing diabetes and 10% were harmed by muscle damage. So is it really worth it? I don't think so. Lowering cholesterol, uh, again, this one uh, is about people who had known heart disease, what happened when they were given statins. 96% saw no benefit, 1.2% were helped by being saved from death, 26 were helped by preventing a repeat heart attack, 0.8% helped by preventing stroke, Again, 2% developed diabetes and 10% had muscle damage. 
Okay, this point, it's worth pointing out that cholesterol is the base molecule that your body utilizes to produce all your steroid hormones. You hear commercials about low T, right? Low T is a big, big problem. You don't manufacture testosterone without cholesterol. Doesn't happen. So cancer is officially the number two leading cause of death, according to the CDC. One in two men and one in three women will develop it at some point in their lifetime. Every year, 500,000 people, uh, a little more than 500,000 people die every year of cancer. According to Samuel Epstein, these stats um, are from his book, and I, I saw a quote where he said that, that these stats are still valid, but I didn't, he didn't expand on that and have it published to verify that, but according to him, these stats are st still valid. Between 1950 and 1990, prostate cancer has increased 155%, thyroid 120, uh, central nervous system 70, breast cancer 60, childhood cancer 35%. So the cancer is going up across the board. Only one in 10 is directly attributable, attributable to a direct genetic causation, which means what? That there's an environmental cause. That is an environmental cause. But everybody here has known somebody that's, that's dealt with cancer, right? Anybody not? Okay. Have you ever heard of anybody that's gone in to see their, their medical doctor when they've been diagnosed with cancer? Were they ever talked about your toxic burden? Has that ever, have you ever heard of that? I've never heard of that. Not once. Now, I've been practiced for 12 years, and not once, and all, all the patients that have come in to see me that have undergone some form of cancer treatment has a doctor talked about the toxic burden. <clears throat> so, in 2009, the total cost of treating all cancers was reported to be 124 billion. By 2020, it's projected to be 158 billion. A study came out, uh, was reported in, in CNN, the World Health Organization, talking about how fast cancer is ra rising. So it's an imminent global disaster with cancer. It reflects aging and lifestyle factors. Okay, the new cancer cases will rise from an estimated 14 million annually in 2012 to 22 million within two decades. Over the same period, cancer deaths are predicted to rise from 8.2 to 13. And he goes on to talk about how his people are primarily living longer, okay? And I gotta tell you, it's not about people living longer. Not, they don't even talk about the, the elephant in the room. And why do I say it's the elephant in the room? Okay, so this, this is a study that was published in the journal Nature, okay? Prestigious journal. And these two scientists, they went and they evaluated the, the literature as well as um, the analyze the mummy remains of, of Egyptians, okay? And this, this is what they, they concluded. Um, the lead author said, it was extremely rare, there was no, nothing in the natural environment that could cause cancer, so it has to be mainly a disease down to pollution and changes of, to our diet and lifestyle. Um, the co-author said, in ancient society, lack of surgical intervention, evidence of cancer should remain in all cases. A virtual absence of malignancies in mummies must be interpreted as indicating their rarity and antiquity, indicating that cancer-causing factors are limited to societies affecting, affected by modern industrialization. So, cancer is something that we're creating, okay? And the people that are responsible for, for treating these things, they don't talk about the elephant in the room. Well, these are the people that <clears throat> are responsible for actually Treating that, and according to the Journal of, Medi Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, in 2000, uh, they they tabulated all the deaths um, that are attributed to uh, conventional medicine. Okay, now they don't officially come out. You won't see it in the reports saying, "Well, conventional medicine is thoroughly caused death." But if you if you tally these up, it comes out to 225,000, and <clears throat> that puts it at number three. Okay. 106,000 people die of non-air negative effects drugs, meaning that the drug was given properly, it was prescribed properly, utilized properly, but yet the adverse effect amounted to them dying, okay? Diabetes, I bring this in here, it's actually number seven on the list of leading causes of death, but it's, it's gonna shoot up there and it actually affects all these other problems, so a lot of people are dealing with like pre-diabetes, it's fueling these problems. So if you're born after the year 2000, it's predicted that one out of three people are gonna develop type 2 diabetes, and yet the CDC and the American uh, Diabetes Association says, we don't know what causes it, really. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going to present to you a little bit of an analogy for how we, we approach healthcare within this country. 
certainly everybody recalls what happened in the Gulf with regard to the BP oil disaster. Is anybody unfamiliar with how they remedy that problem? Are you, you aware? So the way that BP dealt with this problem is that they dumped 1.8 million gallons of a chemical called Corexit, which, which is called the dispersant. So it's kind of like a soap that causes the oil to sink, become submerged. You don't really see it, so it becomes out of sight, out of mind. Okay? That chemical is associated with causing uh, liver and kidney damage. And now there's, there's a number of fish that are showing up in, in the Gulf that um, are starting to manifest these different types of lesions on them. And uh, <clears throat> so this is from the Huffington Post. It said in April 2012, Louisiana State University um, was finding lesions and grotesque deformities in sea life, including millions of shrimp with no eyes and crabs without eyes or claws, possibly linked to the oil dispersants. Well, you didn't see that beforehand, right? So <clears throat> you might be wondering, well, what about all the fish that's actually coming in to our food supply right now from the Gulf? How is the government actually preventing people from, from consuming that, you know, that Corexit or that oil residue, right? There's no lab analysis that's going on. <laughs> the, the, the test that they put in place to deal with this particular problem is that they have some guys actually sniff to see if it passes what they call the sniff test. It's literally sniffing to see if it's toxic or not. That's it. That's it. And then you got Fukushima. Anybody not know that that's an ongoing problem? That's leaking untold amounts of radiation in the, into the Pacific Ocean right now. So there was this yachtsman who, uh, 10 years before, this was uh, in a newspaper, and it was reported all over the internet. He said <clears throat> uh, he had sailed this, the same course from Melbourne to Osaka uh, 10 years prior. He said, this time around there was not uh, not one of the 28 days and a portion of the trip when we didn't catch a good fit size fish. Actually, that was 10 years ago when he, when he experienced that. But this time, on the whole long leg of sea journey, the total catch was two. No fish, no birds, hardly a sign of life at all. And years gone by, I've gotten used to all the birds and their noises. And this is what you're seeing reported if you, you know, you're not going to see it on, on CNN or MSNBC. But if you look in, in smaller newspapers, these reports are actually showing up. You have two-headed whales that wash up on the beach. You have millions of starfish that are dying. That's just one example, right? This is a, a report in, um, it was an article from the LA Times. And the headline was, West Coast Sardine Crash Could Radiate Through the Entire Ecosystem. So you have all these... Um, Sardines that are dying. So the reason for the drop is unclear. Sardine populations are famously volatile with the decline is the steepest since the collapse of the sardine fishery in the mid 20th century, and the numbers are projected to keep sliding. An assessment last fall found the population had dropped 72 percent since its last peak in 2006. So we have obvious amounts of, of toxicity that's, that's going on, and um, you know what? What we could do collectively as a society to, to deal with this problem, I suppose, is we could try to raise some funds, you know, set up a foundation like the Matthew D. Buckley Foundation, and give you a little pink ribbon, and uh, we'll work on trying to find some chemicals that we could dump into the oceans to try and save these fish from the fin rod, from the two-headed whales, you know, and. It kind of sounds absurd. I mean, to me, it would make more sense that maybe we shouldn't be polluting the oceans. Maybe these fish and the starfish wouldn't be dying. Maybe the, uh, the whales wouldn't have two heads. But when you look at the amount of toxicity that's actually released into our environment, <clears throat> and we go about trying to raise all, this, all these funds for like the Susan G. Cohen Foundation, or you name any disease, there's a foundation and an organization raising millions of dollars to allegedly try and stop it, right? And yet they never talk about the elephant in the room. Well, how much toxicity is really released and what's really accumulated? There are 80,000 chemicals that are registered for use in the United States. And 3 million pounds are released every year. That's actually really low, and I'll point out why that is a little bit later. But this is the official number, 3 million pounds are released every year. 
So the environmental working group in 2009, they, they took the umbilical cords of uh, 10 randomly selected babies and they found over 200 toxic chemicals in the core replicating a similar study from 2004. 134 of those chemicals were known to show, uh, shown to cause cancer in lab animals or people, 151 are associated with causing birth defects, 154 are associated with en uh, endocrine disruption, 186 are linked to infertility, 130 are immune system toxins, 158 are neurotoxins. So, you know, the people are being born into this world with, with a heavy toxic burden. My opinion is that what we should be concerned about right now is what is our toxic burden? What are we doing to reduce our toxic burden? Okay? It's not a question of whether or not you have toxicity. The question is, is how bad is it? Okay, and what are you doing to limit your exposure? <laughs> so, Einstein thought the same thing. So, we cannot solve our problems with the same thing we used when we created them. So, I would propose a model of toxins plus your genetic profile plus your infectious burden plus stress plus nutrient status and diet and the environment in which you live equals your health. And fundamentally, fundamentally all that's going to boil down to is how efficiently toxins are able to be removed from the cell and how efficiently you're, you're getting the right amount of nutrients into the cell. The genetic profile dictates a lot of that. Okay? Your nutrient status will determine a large, largely what um, your infectious burden is. And part of the reason why I say that so confidently is that there was a researcher <clears throat> who won a Nobel Prize in 1913. His name was Dr. Alexis Carroll. He managed to keep chicken heart cells alive for 28 years. The chicken is only supposed to live eight years, okay? Those cells were actually destroyed after Dr. Carroll's death, okay? And potentially could have gone on and on and on, but um, uh, due to his death, they just decided to destroy him. But Dr. Carroll said the cell is immortal, it is merely the fluid in which it flows, which generates, renew this fluid at intervals, give the cells what they require for nutrition, and as far as we know, the pulsation of life may go on forever. I think we should integrate that in sort of our philosophy on how we're kind of approaching these problems. Well, you may say, well, you know, I went to the doctor and the doctor ran these blood tests on me and everything came back as normal, so I must be fine. Well, the reality is the way that they're actually tabulating your normal values is that they're taking the general population in and say they're looking for like a liver marker. And they're going to tabulate all the people that are going in and having this particular liver marker and they're going to create a bell curve and they're going to cut off a certain percentage and the people that are outside of that narrower bell, bell curve are going to be determined as the highs and the lows. Okay, well the reality is that we have a sick population that's establishing those curves to begin with. Okay, so Anytime anybody says, well, you know, the doctor said my life was normal, everything's fine, um, I cringe because I know that that's not true. A true normal is going to be much more narrow. We're interested in the functional value, the optimal values. So this is getting into, well, why, why is it that some of those people were able to have MRSA on their system and not turn into the full-blown resistant infection? Or why is somebody able to have... Uh, any of the pathogens or microbes that's associated with disease on the system without causing disease. So this is the father of pathology. His job was to study disease tissue. His name is Rudolf Virchow. He said, if I could live my life over again, I would devote it to proving that, gene, that germs seek their natural habitat, disease tissue, rather than being the cause of dead tissue. In other words, mosquitoes seek stagnant water, not cause the pool to become stagnant. So, imagine you had a, um, you lived in a neighborhood that had a swamp, right? I always use this analogy in my office because it's so appropriate. You have a swamp, you got a mosquito problem, you can spray some insecticide in the air, you dump some in the water, or you can drain the swamp. What's going to result in better results overall? You remove the environment for the, you know, mosquitoes and they're going to go away. So the significance of this point, um, this has been in the news a lot. Uh, the associate director for the CDC was quoted as saying in a recent uh, newspaper article, he said, for a long time there have been newspaper stories and covers of magazines that talked about the end of antibiotics, question mark. So while now I would say you can change the title to the end of antibiotics period. Okay, so people that are accustomed to going in <coughs> to a medical doctor, you know, for, you know, some, strep throat, 
infection, for example, take an antibiotic to deal with that. They're going to find that those aren't working here going forward. So this is just a diagram illustrating um, the perspective that I utilize when evaluating anybody. Uh, our body is, has a structural component, has a chemical component, and a metal component, and each one of these sides can influence another, another side. So structure can affect the chemical. Think of an ankle sprain increasing uh, inflammatory chemicals, right? Everybody's familiar with that. Your structure can affect your emotions in an obvious way, just by long-standing physical trauma inducing pain, which induces depression. The chemical, chemical can affect structure by an infection destroying a tissue. Chemical affect emotion by uh, low serotonin, uh, potentially by amino acid deficiencies or B vitamin deficiency or renal deficiency, fueling depression. And emotions can affect structure. One of the most obvious ways is uh, sexual arousal. I mean, okay. So all disease is cell disease fundamentally. So as I pointed out, the cell can survive without the DNA. It's important, but it can survive survive without it. It's a cell membrane that it can't survive without. And on the outer portion of this structure here, that's the membrane, it's the skin of the cell. <clears throat> and the importance of that is that you want that to be nice and fluid, okay, because that's going to allow nutrients to come in and waste products to go out. And it'll also allow for hormonal receptors to come and pop on out on there to talk to, you know, receive the hormonal signal to carry out its basic function. So, <clears throat> Dr. Carroll again. So the significance of the, of the cell membrane, um, this gets into talking about cancer, okay. I Warburg he was a research scientist who spent his, his entire uh, scientific career investigating the, the physiology of cancer. His research is still valid today. People um, you know, refer to him in the journal articles as well. He says that the prime cause of cancer is the replacement of the respiration of oxygen in normal body cells by fermentation of sugar. And if you're, if you're interested, <clears throat> this book by uh, Brian Peskin, the hidden, the hidden Story of Cancer, Hi there. Um, it gets into how the cell membrane really fuels a lot of disease within the body, particularly cancer. So <clears throat> these are the top five toxins I suggest you remove from your diet. And I'm going to get into how this relates to the cell membrane here in a minute. At the top of the list, you want to remove the trans fats, the toxic oils. Okay. I'll describe what those are in a minute. You want to remove your unfiltered tap water. The, the filtration must filter out fluoride. Okay, that's, that tends to be the biggest one that people are not doing. They're thinking that, that the little filtration element that they have on the refrigerator is sufficient. It's not. It's not going to remove fluoride. You want to remove sugar and refined carbohydrates. Bottom line, if it comes in a box and it's advertised, that's, that's going to be a refined carbohydrate, most certainly. And then the artificial sweeteners, particularly problematic, Splenda, also known as sucralose, aspirin, saccharin are all, all problems. Genetically modified food, um, again, I'm going to go through why those are particularly problematic and how they relate to the cell. <clears throat> I suggest using a Berkey filter, which is a gravity filter, it has special elements on there that will reduce fluoride. There's nothing out there that's going to remove it all. And by the way, this, this information is going to be on my website too, so it will be kind of a summary. But instead of the, the oils that you may be using, you want to make sure you use an extra virgin co coconut oil, organic butter, grapeseed oil for cooking, mm -hmm. sweet with stevia, xylitol, or erythritol. And if you go organic only, you're going to go a long way towards avoid, uh, avoiding some of the, the downsides of genetically modified food. And also suggest replacing plastic with glass. <clears throat> so again, in summary, Never use cottonseed oil, canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, otherwise known as vegetable or margarine. You always want to use those, those oils that I have. Listen there, coconut, grapeseed, sesame, flax, hemp, olive oil. And the significance of that is that the fats, the bad fats, what they do is that that's the raw material for building up the, the cell membrane. So what you're going to get when you're consuming those fats is you're going to get a, a membrane that's going to become more rigid, 
It's not going to allow the toxins to move out very efficiently. The nutrients aren't going to come in very efficiently. And oxygen, oxygen utilization of the cell is going to be impaired. Okay? Again, if the cell can't utilize the oxygen, then you're ripe for cancer. So this is what I refer to as the biochemical triad of health. This is um, sort of a depiction of what I utilize to triangulate around anybody's health problem that comes in with a chronic health problem. Okay? So when it comes to chronic illness, people are dealing with, with multiple factors that are going on that, that's driving the problem. Okay? At the foundation is the gut. Um, I'll explain why in a minute. <clears throat> then you got insulin and blood sugar, and then adrenal and thyroid function, as you can all read there. And I'll explain the, the, how they all interrelate here in a minute. But these things you can, you can monitor on your own to see where you're at if you, if you pay attention. And you can kind of you can get somewhat of an idea as, as to how you're really trending in the wrong direction. Uh, before I get into that, um, I didn't really mention this, but I should have. <clears throat> when it comes to the uh, the fats and the potential deficiency of the fats, one way to determine if you're if you're having problems with your fats is do you have dry skin? So if you have dry skin, then the cell membranes aren't getting the nourishment that they need. Okay, that's one way to kind of figure that out. Then you can, always, you can use a pulse oximeter, which is a little device you can measure your own oxygen levels that are kind of coursing through your body. And if it's on the lower end, um, you, should, you should be somewhat alarmed by that because you're in a sort of a ripe state for going in the wrong direction as far as cancer is concerned. So the father of medicine, Socrates, or Hipp Hippocrates, he said over 2,000 year ago, years ago, all disease begins in the gut. And the guy was spot on. <laughs> spot on. The foundation of, of the triad of biochemical health being the gut, approximately 80% of the, the immune system is found within the gut. Do you know that? No, it's not really talked about much. 50% of your dopamine is produced within the gut. You know anybody that's got low energy tendency towards depression? Should be thinking about dopamine. 95% of all serotonin is actually produced in the gut. You know, you can think about how much uh, Prozac is prescribed what, what that's trying to affect. Twenty percent of your thyroid hormone is actually converted into um, its active form within the gut. And there was a, a study, uh, NPR reported on this uh, about a month or so ago, where what they did, they, they had these uh, two groups of rats, <clears throat> and one group of rats were more prone to being fearful, and they had another group of rats that were more uh, demonstrating of bravery and they were able to transpose the microbiome of each rat so the <clears throat> the fearful rats got the the germs of the brave rats the brave rats got the germs of the fearful rats and what they found was that the personalities reversed And that's what I've seen over and over again in working with people that have raised one of the chronic illness. I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna get anywhere if you neglect the gut. You won't. And that's dealing with people that have various types of uh, mental and emotional problems. Yeah. So I wanted to be able to play a little video that kind of got into the microbiome, but I'm having trouble getting that to play. So the bottom line is that <clears throat> you're you're your intestines and your, your entire body actually has more microbes living in and on it than what it does cells in the body. And so what we want is we want to make sure that those microbes are, are beneficial and they're not going in the direction of patho uh, pathogenicity. So this, <clears throat> this is a diagram illustrating what our, our intestines look like. Okay, you got uh, these intestinal cells right here and these are indicating what are called the tight junctions that hold the, the, the cells together. <clears throat> and what happens when you consume um, a lot of the things that I'd advise you to uh, avoid, you're going to start to develop breakdowns within those tight junctions. And the microbes that are, have been sitting in there, they can go into the bloodstream and they can go find homes in different tissues. And this, <clears throat> this is the root cause of, of all autoimmunity, almost without exception. There's a, there's a few exceptions. There's a couple other different causes that may drive it, but fundamentally, it's all linked to the gut. 
And 12 years of, of working with people that have an autoimmune condition, I've never seen anybody that does that with gut. <clears throat> So this is actually it's um, a hot topic within the research community right now. So if you go into PubMed, PubMed, you can just try to see what the, the researchers are, are trying to find as far as scientific research goes. If you just type in heart disease and microbiome, you're going to find 62 studies. Heart disease in the gut returns 749 studies. Probiotics in the heart returns 68 studies. The microbiome in cancer returns 642 studies. The microbiome in diabetes returns 398. Now granted, not all of those are going to be specifically on point, but it just shows you that there's a connection. <clears throat> um, so this is, this is one of the studies that pointed out heart disease, because a lot of people are going to think, well, what, is it really, what does the gut have to do with heart disease? They seem like they're so disconnected, right? So this study right here said, uh, within the abstract, the current drug metabolism from 2009, there was increasing evidence for the gut to have a pathophysiological role for both chronic inflammation and malnutrition and congestive heart failure. Indeed, disturbed intestinal microcirculation and barrier function in congestive heart failure seem to trigger cytokine generation, which is an inflammatory response, thereby contributing to further impairment in cardiac function. The bottom line pointed out how it looks like reducing cholesterol doesn't really create the sort of results that you would want in reducing cardiovascular disease. The, the, the research out there shows that the bigger cause of cardiovascular disease tends to be this inflammation. And what the study is essentially saying is that uh, issues within the gut increase inflammation and can set you up for heart disease. This is on my website. I've got a section that I explain uh, how autoimmunity actually occurs within the body. And this is just a summary of some of the studies uh, that point out that leaky gut is, is the unifying thread that unites all of these um, autoimmune conditions. This was a, a study in Nature Clinical Practice Gastroenterology and Hepatology from 2005. <clears throat> and this kind of hammers on my point that they're, it's related to leaky gut, uh, autoimmune, that is. It says, this new theory implies that once the autoimmune process is activated, it's not self-perpetuating. Rather, it can be modulated or even reversed by preventing the continuous interplay between genes and the environment. As tight junction dysfunction uh, allows this interaction, remember that's, the, that's holding those cells within the intestines together, New therapeutic strategies aimed at reestablishing the intestinal barrier function are offering innovative, unexplored approaches for the treatment of these devastating diseases. Bottom line, what they're saying is that if you can repair the, the leaky gut, you, you go a long way to re towards reversing these autoimmune conditions. What alters the gut fuels disease? Okay, fluoride, the chlorine within there is going to alter your gut. Okay, sugar is going to alter the gut. It's going to feed pathogenic microbes. Yeast is always found with the intestines, but it can feed the wrong guys. The sugar can feed the wrong guys. Artificial sweeteners will al alter the microbe balance, particularly Splenda. Refined carbohydrates, you know, any of your um, cereals, white flour, that sort of thing is going to alter the, the flora. Then the herbicides and GMOs. Now, <clears throat> the toxins that I'm talking about and advising people to avoid, it's, it's kind of like um, you have a bowl of grapes. And, you have one, one bowl of grapes where the grapes are all connected to the, the stalk, right? And then you have another grape, another bowl of grapes there. There's individual grapes there, okay? If you wanted to grab a bunch of grapes, you would grab the stalk and you pull it up and have all those grapes, okay? If you avoid the toxins that I'm pointing out, it's going to be like you pulling up the, the big stalk of the grapes, okay? It's going to have that profound effect. It's going to carry with it a number of the toxins that I'm not even going to mention today. So in your, in your water, the hydrofluorosilicic acid, that's what the, the city of Austin puts in your water, it's a form of fluoride. Chloramines, prescription drugs, and xenoestrogens, which is BPA, okay? And this is, a, <clears throat> this is a short list, there's many more other chemicals in there. You'll want to filter it, filter the fluoride out. I'm gonna explain why the, filter, the fluoride filtration is so important. Dr. Dean Burke, who spent 34 years in the National Cancer Institute, said that in point of fact, fluoride causes more human cancer and death and it causes it faster than any other chemical. <clears throat> Why is that? Well, this gets into what uh, Otto Warburg was saying as it relates to the causation of cancer. Uh, uh, Otto Warburg said that fundamentally, 
uh, cancer is stuck in this process of glycolysis. Okay, this is <clears throat> every cell in your body generates energy utilizing glucose or, or fat to, to generate energy. And ultimately, the currency of energy within your body is something called ATP. Okay, the first phase is called glycolysis. The second phase, where it enters the mitochondria and it operates with oxygen, <clears throat> is called the citric acid cycle. If you inhibit the ability for this pyruvate to go into the citric acid cycle, you're going to be reduced in the amount of ATP, ATP that you're going to generate. You're going to generate 2 ATP versus 36 ATP. Okay? Significant difference. So you're going to be stuck with a little energy. Now, when it comes to um, fluoride, this is a research article uh, where they talk about util utilizing so sodium fluoride. So sodium fluoride is, is actually different than the hydrofluorosilicic acid that's put in your water, but they're, they're similar, okay? The significance of the sodium fluoride is that <clears throat> in lab studies, when they're trying to inhibit glycolysis, this first part of the energy, energy production within the cell, they utilize sodium fluoride to do just that. And that's what's being dumped into your water supply, okay? That's what's being dumped into your water supply. So what do you think that's going to do beside? That affects every cell in your body. Every cell in the body is going to be impaired in its ability to generate energy. So again, this is, this is Dr. Warburg. Um, he said, he hypothesized that cancer, malignant growth, and tumor growth are caused by the fact that tumor cells mainly generate energy, ATP, by non-oxidative breakdown of glucose, a process called glycolysis, as I said. This is in contrast to healthy cells, which mainly generate energy from oxidative break breakdown of pyruvate. You know, the pyruvate is able to get, go into the cell and to generate its energy. Pyruvate is the end product of glycolysis and is oxidized within the mitochondria. Hence, according to Warburg, the driver of cancer cells should be interpreted as stemming from a lowering of mitochondrial respiration. So, <clears throat> if there's going to be something that interferes with um, that pyruvate going into the cell, think cancer. That's what Dr. Warburg said it was. And like I said, his research is still valid. It's still being used. <laughs> So this is the warning label that comes on the bags of hydrofluorosilicic acid that gets dumped in the water supply. It's dangerous. It says, uh, do not take internally. And by the way, that chemical is actually a, a waste product from industrial use that um, if, if the companies that were producing it didn't have this nice arrangement with the government, they would have to pay for hazardous waste disposal. In turn, they're, they're making money off of this. In fact, tomorrow, Austin City Council is going to, going to discuss whether or not they renew ordering more fluoride. They're going to do it. They've had presentations. They've, they've had like the leading experts on, on fluoride go and speak, speak to the city council and the mayor. And they're like, what time is it? When can I get out of here? It's ridiculous. This stuff is poisoning people. <laughs> Why did they put it in there? Well, that's a good What's question. What's their rationale? Well, because they're going to try and save, save people's teeth is, is the claim. That's the claim. You know, but the thing is, is that <clears throat> when, you, uh, when you're out in the sun and you're trying to avoid a sunburn, do you drink a sun, suntan lotion? Or do you put it on your skin? Right. It's the same principle. You know, if you believe that it's actually good for the teeth, why not just you know, allow people to pr provide it themselves, you know? It doesn't make sense. <clears throat> I didn't, put, I didn't put this in here, but there's, there's a study that came out, a uh, Harvard study, it was just out within the last couple of days, showing that well, what does is, what is the fluoride in the water do, do to uh, the health of people within the United States? There were many things that they, that they cited, but one of the interesting things was that they, they showed that it lowered the IQ on average of seven uh, IQ points. Seven IQ points. Who benefits from that? Who do you think wants a dumbed-down population? <laughs> the United States government. Absolutely. So these are some kids enjoying some genetically modified corn from Monsanto. Mm -hmm. And here are some uh, farmers uh, applying some chemicals on your, on your food. Isn't that a little absurd, you know? You got these people that are, that are spraying all the stuff on your food, and yet we're supposed to believe that that's safe. 
So the big problem, <clears throat> as I see it, with regard to the, the genetically modified food, is that what they're doing is that they're modifying these, these crops to become more tolerant to the herbicide called Roundup. So Roundup <clears throat> will kill, will kill uh, any plant, okay? But they've altered the gene to be allowed these crops to become more tolerant to the Roundup on there. So what's, the, what's the Roundup? Roundup is a, it's an herbicide. Okay. Okay. Uh, you'll see that I, ha I have glyphosate listed on, on some of these studies and some of these slides. And glyphosate <clears throat> is one of the base ingredients of Roundup. Okay. But there's other things that go in Roundup also, which are also toxic. And 85% <clears throat> of the U.S. corn supply is, is currently uh, genetically modified, meaning that it's got uh, Roundup residue on it for, for sure. 90% of the soybean supply has it. Both corn and soy make up the bulk of the food supply as it relates to the feed of chickens and cows, right? And <clears throat> the EPA reported that 185 million pounds of glyphosate was used by farmers in 2007. So if you recall, I mentioned that 3 million pounds of toxins are allegedly re released into the environment every year in the United States. We had 185 million pounds of glyphosate that was used by farmers in 2007. So it's a lot more than 3 million pounds. <laughs> Okay, so <clears throat> the, the toxicity of, of Roundup glyphosate associated with cancer, hormonal disruption, and fertility, virtually everything that, that, that you could possibly imagine. And so there was a study um, that involved these rats that was performed by an Italian scientist. <clears throat> you see these massive tumors on it? Do you see that? Yeah. The massive tumors, <clears throat> and this study involved utilizing 10 rats. Uh, it actually mirrored a study that Monsanto had done a few years prior. Monsanto's study was identical, um, except it didn't. It only did it for like two months versus two years. So Sirlani, the guy of this study, carried it out to its to its finality, and he saw all these all these tumors. He published his results. Well, they attacked him within the mainstream media. They smeared it. They tried to ruin him. The journal journal that, that uh, published the article they actually retracted it, claiming that well, you know. It was unscientific. It was the same study that Monsanto did. It was only longer. Everything about it was identical, except it was longer. So that just gives you an idea of like how much control Monsanto really has over everything. And these, I, we don't have time to go into all of these, but um, if you wanted to look at it, you see how uh, the Roundup is altering our gut ecology. It's affecting the gut. Fueling a lot of different problems. So, uh, this was a study that I thought, thought was noteworthy. So, the Roundup actually accumulates in Roundup ready GM soybeans. Using 35 different nutritional and elemental variables as characteristics, each soy sample, we were able to discriminate uh, genetically modified conventional organic soybeans without exception, demonstrating substantial non equivalence and compositional characteristics for ready to market soybeans. So, <clears throat> what that means is that. They, they appear to be the same, but they're actually different from a chemical level. That's what the, this research actually shows. This was interesting, I thought, because this, this research was done on, uh, on rats. It didn't involve humans, but I think you can probably extrapolate from that and see how it may relate to humans. So were, <clears throat> they found that at um, more than non-toxic con non concentrations of Roundup and glyphosate, at one part per million, the main endocrine disruption is a testosterone decrease by 35%. Again, think about low T. You've got multiple factors going on here when people when we're talking about low T. So cholesterol, lowering cholesterol, is that a good idea? I don't think so. <clears throat> so government to the rescue again. On July 1st of 2013, the EPA announced that it increased the amount of Glyphosate residue allowable in food. The new regulation raises glyphosate levels in oilseed crops, which include sesame flax, soybean, uh, from 20 parts per million to 40 parts per million. Also raises the allowable glyphosate contamination level for sweet potatoes and carrots from 0.2 to 3 parts per million for sweet potatoes and 5 parts per million for carrots, which is 15 times and 25 times greater than the previous levels. So these these are kind of interesting slides. <clears throat> so 
don't know if you know it, but uh, this is Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas is a member of our Supreme Court. He says, I, well, I'm Clarence Thomas. I worked, at Monsanto, worked as a Monsanto attorney for four years. I'm now a Supreme Court justice, and I've ruled in favor of Monsanto against the people every time. This is an extreme conflict of interest. Luckily, I'm above the law. It's true. He should recuse himself any time there's a, there's a ruling that, that reaches that level relative to um, Monsanto and anything that they do. Well, Obama's got the solution, though. So <clears throat> he decided that um, he was going to bring in Michael Taylor. So meet Michael Taylor. He's a former VP for public policy in Monsanto. Okay. Now <clears throat> he's a food safety czar for the FDA. I'm backing up a little bit. So they were talking about the soybeans and even organic soybeans. So if you're eating organic tofu, you're still getting the toxicity. You should. It shouldn't be in there. Oh, it shouldn't? Okay. No. As long as it's non-GMO. As long as it's non-GMO. So can it say organic and still be GMO? Yeah. Okay. No, it has no, no, to say no. non-GMO. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. There's no labeling requirements for non-GMO right now. As long as it says organic on it, it they, that's the cutoff point. There's not any... It shouldn't be genetically modified. Okay. Okay. The so question is, you know, how, how reliable is that? I don't know. Okay, so <clears throat> Splenda is rapidly becoming one of the most popular sweeteners on the market. Um, this is a study um, involving what happened with Splenda. And it's saw that Splenda exerted numerous adverse effects, including the reduction of beneficial microflora. Again, Remember, if you reduce the beneficial microflora, what you're, what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for the unifying threat of all autoimmune disease, on top of the other diseases that it's associated with as well. So the gut health warning lights. Okay, <clears throat> you gotta look, you gotta look at these uh, these symptoms as as clues to something that's going on within your body. Don't ignore them. Don't mask them. If you do, you're setting your you're, you're going to allow um, disease to persist within your body and grow within your body. So indigestion, heartburn, foul gas, chronic bad breath, that's protein maldigestion, by the way. <clears throat> Belching, that tends to be yeast overgrowth. Constipation, can be any number of infections, thyroid dysfunction, diarrhea, commonly infections, sometimes food allergies, loose stools, and usually infection, non-brown colored stools, that can be a number of things going on body and greasy stools. That's fat, fat maldigestion. Okay, so we're bringing us on over into the, the other portion of uh, the triad of biochemical health that we want to <clears throat> protect. Insulin and blood sugar, alterations within insulin and blood sugar associated with Alzheimer's, arthritis, cancer, chronic fatigue, depression, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. And I don't have a list here, but uh, I did a newsletter on this <clears throat> where there's some good research to show that uh, Alzheimer's is fundamentally insulin resistance within the brain. It's a blood sugar disorder within the brain. So you want to pay attention to your blood sugar. So here's a little math equation. Bob has 36 candy bars. He eats 29. What, is, what does he have now? <laughs> I got diabetes. <laughs> If you're gonna, <clears throat> this is something that I advocate everybody do. Get yourself a blood sugar monitoring kit from Walgreens, CVS, and start checking your blood sugar. You check it first thing in the morning. You wanna make sure that it's below 99. Um, I'll explain why it should be actually a little bit lower now. Below, <clears throat> this is the oral glucose tolerance test. That's where you like slam a bunch of uh, glucose. And you want it to be below 140 in your hemoglobin A1C, which has to do with how much sugar is actually bound to your red blood cells. You want that, from a blood test standpoint, to be into that particular number there. The significance of um, monitoring your, your blood sugar is that if you check it like 45, 45 minutes after a meal, that should be your peak value. And you always want to make sure that that number is below 140. Because above 140, that's when you're going to start to develop cell death. And this, I don't have it totally printed out here so you can see it, but <clears throat> the study here shows that elevations of blood sugar above 140 actually induce beta cell death. And beta cells are the, the cells within the pancreas that release insulin. 
This is a study that said, compared with those with fasting plasma glucose levels less than 85 milligrams per deciliter, subjects with uh, glucose levels of 95 to 99 were 2.33 times more likely to develop diabetes. Okay, so blood sugars have been found to increase the risk of cancer, which <clears throat> makes sense. You know, if if the, the glucose can't get into the cell, you remember? Remember what I was talking about? The glucose can't get into the cell, and your blood sugar is actually raising. Wellness by 40. Wellness by 40. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what you get if, if the glucose can't enter the cell to actually go into that mitochondrial function, that aerobic respiration, it's going to ferment. And you're going to create an environment that's very conducive towards cancer. And there's, <clears throat> there's a, a medical doctor, an oncologist out of Italy, who treats cancer as if it's a fungal infection using baking soda, and he has a lot of success in doing so. And um, so, interesting. And it's worth noting here that Big Pharma, the pharmaceutical industry, donates approximately $20 million every year to the American Diabetes Association, which provides conventionally accepted medical guidelines of the blood sugar. So you can't trust what it is they're saying. The only thing that's really trustworthy is what the research actually says, and that's what I'm presenting to you tonight. This is a study that just came out a couple weeks ago. Um, it said, we observed a significant relationship between added sugar consumption and increased risk for cardiovascular mortality. <clears throat> those with the highest sugar intake had a four times greater risk of heart attacks compared with those with the lowest. 20 ounces of soda increases your risk of heart attack by 30%. And it was a large study. Of all the over 40,000 people, accounted for all potential risk factors, including calories, overall diet quality, smoking, cholesterol, B, uh, blood pressure, obesity, and alcohol. Bottom line, sugar, sugar is a big time killer. Your natural sugars, like uh, your fruits. Well, that's where you want to. Yeah, even those can be problematic. And a lot of people actually are fructose in, intolerance. Fructose is a sugar that's found in fruit, and they'll, that'll fuel diabetes. So check your blood sugar, check it fasting. <clears throat> Ideally, um, you know, 86 is going to be what you're, you know, between 75 and 86 is really what you should, should shoot for in the morning when you wake up. If you're doing eating a paleolithic diet, which is the diet that I advocate, um, you, <clears throat> you can start to get into where you're actually burning fats and your uh, fasting blood sugar can rise because you're doing that. So it can be a little bit misleading, and that's where like doing additional blood tests to make sure that um, you know you're you're not causing too much glycation, which is the sugar bound to the tissues and destroying tissues. So as I said, you want your you want your blood sugar never to go above 140, <clears throat> and it should return really back to normal after after a couple hours. And your hemoglobin A1C should be um, below 5.3. Okay, then we're getting into the next side of the biochemical triad of health. I'll try and go through this fast so you guys are getting tired. It's kind of a long presentation. Um, <clears throat> so what do the adrenals do? They allow the body to respond to stress, whether it's mental, emotional, biochemical, or structural. It doesn't matter. You're going to allow your body to adapt to stress. They help regulate your blood sugars and pressure. They aid in the immune system response. They secrete uh, cortisol, DHEA, testosterone, uh, estrogen, and aldosterone, which, by the way, a lot of people that have low testosterone symptoms are fundamentally uh, adrenal problems. A lot of women that enter into menopause and have a whole lot of problems at that point in time, it's an adrenal problem fundamentally. Another picture of the adrenal glands. So these are the hypoadrenal symptoms. You have trouble staying asleep, crave salt. So we'll start in the morning, afternoon fatigue, dizziness when standing up, afternoon headaches, headaches with exertion or stress, weak nails. And an unstable body temperature, and I'll get into this in a minute, because this is one of the best ways to kind of monitor your adrenal function. So the hyperfunction, they also cause problems. You can't stay asleep also, perspire easily under high amounts of stress, weight gain when under stress, wake up tired after six or more hours of sleep. Which, by the way, that, that book, if any of this sound familiar to you, Adrenal Fatigue, 21st Century Stress Syndrome, <clears throat> it's worth reading. So how to test uh, for adrenal dysfunction, if you get yourself a blood sugar or a, um, 
blood pressure cuff. You check your blood, check your blood pressure while you're laying down, record the value, and then stand up, repeat, and you look at the values. If it, if it decreases or stays the same, that's an indication of adrenal insufficiency. <clears throat> which you should interpret as immune system dysfunction because that's ultimately what it is. You can also uh, use a little light, shine like a little pen light in somebody's eyes, you look at the pupils. The pupils should <clears throat> constrict when the light comes on in. When somebody has adrenal problems, the, the pupils will kind of flutter. Okay, so that's another good clue. So if you have, um, and that it tends to be like hypofunction. <clears throat> underactive. So adrenal hyperfunction, where they're kicking out too much of the hormones, that's really generally a, the, the classical symptom is you have trouble falling asleep and staying asleep and waking in the middle. So if you, take, if you take your temperature, one of the ways, the best ways to do it, you <clears throat> measure your temperature three times a day. Um, I recommend using a, a non-digital thermometer you can still find them like CVS, not mercury based. And the non digital thermometer will be the most accurate. The, the digital ones, I have not found any that I thought were accurate. You measure them three times a day, like three hours apart. So say at 9 o'clock, noon, and then 3 o'clock. Average those numbers, plot it on your chart. <clears throat> and I've got these, these uh, temperature graphs on my website if you want to download this kind of experiment with that. And what you'll see if you have an adrenal problem, your, your temperatures will tend to fluctuate. Bounce on around. And this just kind of shows somebody who went on some adrenal support, starts to become a little bit more stable, and eventually it, it should reach the point of 98.6. So, thyroid function <clears throat> much of the research on, on thyroid is really centered around uh, a mentor of mine, Dr. Dottis Karazian. He wrote this book, Why Do I Still Have Thyroid Symptoms When the Lab Tests Are Normal? <clears throat> He has a great quote. He says, every cell in the body has receptor sites for thyroid hormones. Thyroid hormones are responsible for the most basic and fundamental aspect of physiology, the basic metabolic rate. Lack of ideal thyroid hormone leads to global decline in cellular function of all bodily functions. The thyroid is a central web gear in the complex web of metabolism and extremely sensitive to minor imbalances of, of other areas of physiology. <clears throat> Meaning that nothing works right with inadequate amounts of active thyroid hormone getting into the cell. Nothing works right. And I'm going to tie tie in how the gut plays a role within that. So this is a quick diagram. Your pituitary talks to your thyroid. The thyroid is told to release the thyroid hormone. That thyroid hormone is fundamentally something called T4. T4 is largely biologically inactive. That T4 has to go on down to the liver where 60% of that should be converted into what's called T3. That's the active form. That's what you want. That's the most important marker for thyroid, okay, it's a T3. Now if the liver is congested, toxic for any reason, it can create something called reverse T3, which is like a mirror image of that. And that, <clears throat> that mirror image will go to the thyroid receptors of every cell, because remember this thyroid hormone, it touches on every cell, it tells the cells to start generating energy, okay. But if you have this reverse T3 that's building up, you don't have an adequate amounts of T3 to begin with, it'll block it from going in there. So this is how a toxic liver can affect your thyroid's expression. Likewise, 20%, as I pointed out earlier, 20% of your T4 is converted into uh, T3 <clears throat> within the, uh, the intestines. So if you have altered gut function, you're going to have altered thyroid expression. Your medical doctors, what they're looking at are, are two fundamental markers when they're looking at your thyroid function. They're looking at something called TSH, which is a hormone which tells your uh, pituitary to talk to your thyroid gland. <clears throat> and if that's in a particular range, you know, they may diagnose you as, as have, having hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. Or they may look at something called T4, which is the inactive form. But they're not, most of them anyway, aren't going to look at some of these other markers. Okay, so there's a lot of people that are walking around with subclinical thyroid problems that, you know, just haven't been diagnosed properly because they're not looking at the full picture of what's going on with the thyroid. So remember, remember what I said, the unifying thread of all autoimmunity is leaky gut. This is a study from 1988. <clears throat> uh, clinical endocrine metabolism said that 
and autoimmune cause accounts for approximately 90% of adult hypothyroidism. <clears throat> so if, if leaky gut's a primary cause for autoimmunity, and I believe that it is, and 90% of people that have hypothyroidism uh, have Hashimoto's, then 90% of the population has some form of leaky gut that have hypothyroidism. And how many people have ever been told that? So again, this is just uh, kind of highlights from <clears throat> some, of, some of the studies that I have on my website just kind of supporting that idea that leaky gut is the root cause of autoimmune diseases. Here's a study um, involving people with Hashimoto's, which is the autoimmune thyroid disorder, and who also tested positive for uh, the bacteria that's associated with ulceration called H. pylori. And what they found was that these people had these uh, elevated thyroid peroxidase enzyme markers <clears throat> prior to the treatment, right? And then they treated for the H. pylori, and what they saw was that these markers for the autoimmunity went way down. <clears throat> so that just, again, supports the idea that if you're going to correct the gut, you're going to go a long way towards potentially affecting your autoimmune condition specifically as it relates to thyroid. So, really, thyroid, these are really just like some of the, the symptoms. Thyroid dysfunction affects everything because it, again, it controls the metabolism every, every cell within the body. So, your classic signs, tired, sluggish, feel cold, require excessive amounts of sleep to function, increase weight, even with a low-calorie diet, gain weight easily, uh, difficult infrequent bowel movements, depression, lack of motivation, morning headaches, that wear off as the day progresses, your outer third of your eyebrow thins. Once you lose that, it doesn't really come back, and you kind of notice that you're kind of, kind of Isn't lost. Isn't that natural when you age a little bit? No. No? You shouldn't. I don't believe any of this stuff is really natural. It's common. We, we, common. we, we associate it as being mm -hmm. natural because it's so common. But I, I tend to view this as from the perspective that aging is fundamentally a disease process that's being promoted by toxicity and a lack of nutrients from the cell. Mm -hmm. So, with uh, thyroid hypofunction, the classic <clears throat> marker too is the low body temperature, and this is the one that's consistently low. So if you're gonna chart your temperatures, what you'll see is a, you'll see how it's <clears throat> gonna be more like steady start to correct it. These are the signs of a thyroid hyperfunction, heart palpitations, and trembling, increased pulse of rest. You don't see so much of this, but it does occur. Some people with Hashimoto's, they can fluctuate between the, the high thyroid symptoms and the, and the low thyroid symptoms. So self-monitoring thyroid function, check your body temperature, do some survey. So there's a couple of slides that I apparently didn't get saved on there. But the last one was <clears throat> really just, just saying that there's a lot of things that are wrong right now. And um, I don't believe that we can count on the government to really change any of these for us. Okay? I just don't think that's going to happen. In fact, they appear to be acting in every way to make things worse for us. The only thing that I believe that we can really do is we can, we can vote with our, our dollars that we spend we can support the things that we want and reject the things that we don't, okay? So when you're going out, if you go out to a restaurant, and you got, you know, I understand that not everybody's going to go and avoid GMOs, you know, right away. I understand that. But if you're going out to a restaurant, make a point to ask the manager, you know, if you're going to a Tex-Mex restaurant, you're like serving corn chips, make a point to ask them, are these chips genetically modified or not? <laughs> are they organic? If enough people start doing this, the, they're going to start providing it, you know? I mean, it, and it would be worth it if you just paid maybe a couple dollars more when you went out for a meal that you didn't have to worry about this stuff. Because it accumulates, you know? It accumulates. You came, you know, people are coming into the, into the world with a significant toxic burden as it is, you know? And it's not going to take much more to kind of put them over the edge of this chronic illness state. Which, by the way, according to the CDC, one in two Americans is dealing with some form of chronic illness. And that 75% of all healthcare costs are directed towards the management and treatment of chronic illness right now. 75% of all the healthcare costs. Now, what 
Well, what, are, what are they really doing? They're only managing it. They're, they're not getting at the fundamental roots. And they're not going to. The doctors, if you go see a conventional medical doctor, how much time do you spend with you, really? If you're going through like a, using your insurance, five, 10 minutes maybe? They're not gonna talk about these things. The only way we're gonna turn around is that this sort of information becomes mainstream. And so, small group tonight, I plan on getting this on the internet, trying to do my part, but um, hopefully you guys will integrate this in your lifestyle and reap the benefits. Because I'm certain, I'm absolutely certain, that you will reap benefits if you integrate it in your lifestyle. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how toxic is the fluoride if you're just showering with it, but you're not drinking it? That's a good question. I mean, it's not good. You're getting some in here. Mm -hmm. you know, you're breathing in some of those vapors. And the problem with fluoride is it's really, really difficult to remove. I got a shower filter on, on my shower at home, but it doesn't remove fluoride. The best thing to do, if you can afford it, is have like a whole house shower filter, water filter, that uh, has a special fluoride reduction on it. I get some better money. The other thing, somehow, some way, get involved with uh, you know, uh, there's an organization within Austin that's dedicated towards removing fluoride. They're going to be, you know, trying to raise hell at uh, city council tomorrow. But try and support them. <clears throat> What's the name of the organization? Fluoride Free Austin. Any other questions? Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it.